thank you for joining us. And uh, our next talk is going to be on horse racing. Yeah. Um, it's going to be on horse racing, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to Russell Butterini. Okay, we're having a one-hour analysis of this year's Kentucky Derby. Thanks, man. Wow. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you, Ming, for that, that wonderful introduction. I, I appreciate that. Now, now everybody knows I'm a gambling degenerate. Um, and uh, I also want to say, sir, this outfit in the front row is fantastic. Um, you have Vegas, DEF CON. It's all captured there. So very, very well done. Very well done. So uh, this is Fishing Freakonomics. So like Ming said, my name is Russell Butterini. I am the senior security architect at a uh, top 20 CPA firm that is, I'm required to not name. Um, What's that? But yeah, that's exactly it. Don't you love when you go to a hair conference? They're like, I have my secret employer, and you go to LinkedIn and you can look it up. You know, very good OSINT, sir. I appreciate that. Uh, appreciate that. Um, so um, it's good. I have actually, I think my voice has had about as much of Las Vegas as it can handle for the week. So hopefully it'll uh, it'll hold out. Uh, you may see me chugging water during this talk copiously, but um, yeah. So. Um, I don't, I, the abstracts, I guess, weren't in the book. If you didn't have a chance to look, um, this talks a lot about uh, user awareness and training and correlating data from different sources to figure out who your highest risk users are and how to remediate that. But I think there's a lot more to it than that, in that if you're a pen penetration tester or even an attacker, a bad guy, and want to know who are the users you should be targeting as part of your efforts, then... Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I think there's a lot of value for a different audience and different folks, so we'll get started. So uh, a little bit about me, and I have to clarify just to make sure nobody knows. Last year when I, or everybody knows, uh, I was here uh, and I was sitting at dinner one night uh, and, and this girl um, who had had a lot to drink uh, comes up to me and says, are you one of the property brothers? So just for clarification, I'm not one of the property brothers. I don't know where that came from, but uh, it's a good Vegas story to tell, so I thought I'd throw that in. But um, I am the, uh, like I said, I'm over all the IT security things for a CPA firm. Uh, we're the 19th largest in the U.S. And... Um, it's a lot of fun. I have my uh, security and compliance dictatress, Christy, who is uh, uh, a lot of help and really good to work with. Uh, and we have good complementary skill sets, even though we, uh, we butt heads sometimes. But um, that's why I'm on Twitter. Uh, you can find me there. There's occasionally security things there. There's a lot of horse racing things, too. Uh, there's also horse racing things in this talk, so be warned. Um, present, I presented here five years ago. Uh, I present B-Sides, DerbyCon, things like that. Um, and uh, the standard disclaimer is these are my opinions, and this is not my employer sponsoring this talk, and this is all my own research. So um, anyway, so I, I always like to start my talks with why, why do I think the talk is important to give? And these quotes on the board, I kid you not, are things that I've actually heard said inside um, talks at different security conferences I've been to. Uh, and it's always just phishing always works. You know, users are stupid, and it only takes one. And the thing that's always interesting to me about that is I've been around the community here for a number of years now. Gosh, probably going back to 2004, 2006. And um, I just, we've never been a community that just accepted something as a universal truth or unfixable, right? So why are we perceiving the user awareness problem and the phishing problem this way? Why do we, you know, why do we just say, like, this is always going to work. It's never going to change. Let's just give up. And so... Hopefully, this talk gives you guys some ideas on how you can fix it in your own environment. So I'll tell you, I like stories, and I'll t this talk will largely be a story. Um, and uh, you know, I came in uh, to my current employer about a little over two years ago. Uh, there really was no training and awareness program in place. There really wasn't a formal information security program in place. Um, never done any testing, never done any annual training. I'm sure how many people at their job, you have the big annual, you have to sit down for three hours and watch videos and yeah so that none of that existed which the, given the type of data we handle and the things we also recommend a lot of our clients do really didn't make a lot of sense it was one of the first things I wanted to get addressed uh, and there wasn't a lot of structure um, so if say a user got a suspect email sometimes they would forward it to their boss sometimes they forward it to my boss sometimes they send it to the help desk um, and so we started to correct all that um, we picked a, a training vendor uh, and and started to unify some things. We actually had a mailbox where we would review the messages and uh, send feedback, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but, um, you know, it, it was a lot to fix. Um, but we, I thought we really had it off the ground nicely. So we did uh, a handful of phishing tests, and enough where I thought I had a pretty good statistical baseline um, for where we were as a firm, and, and we had a 5.6% failure rate. And 5.6 isn't too bad. 
you know, it's a little little above where I'd like us to be. I'd like us to be in the two to three percent range. Um, but I, I thought, you know, we're doing pretty good. So we did all the things, right? You know, you give the people the training, you print out the funny posters, and you you put them all over the office with the passwords are like your underpants. That's one of my favorite ones. You know, make sure to change them regularly. Some people at DEF CON could use that advice, uh, but uh, that uh, anyway, three, two, one rule, folks. That's all I'm saying. Quick uh, PSA here. Uh, but, um, you know, 5.6%, that wasn't too bad. And so, so we did all this stuff, and I was telling, we were ready to do another one, and I was telling uh, one of my colleagues, I said, man, I was like, people are really grasping this. We've hit them with everything. They're, they're loving it. Everybody seems really engaged. We're going to get down to like 4% next time. It's going to be awesome. We're going to, you know, we're going to kill it, and we're, and we're, we're going to be in really good shape. So we give the next test, and that happened. We got worse. And that's the kind of thing that I just, it makes me want to scream. I don't know how you guys are, but when I, uh, you know, when you put a lot of effort into something and, and the, the result gets worse, I, I just, it, it, it makes you want to just throw your hands up and give up and, and say, you know, security's hopelessly broken. We're never going to do this. And it makes me start to think back to those quotes I showed at the ori uh, original, uh, or the few slides ago uh, in the presentation. And just like, gosh, you know, well, what happened here? So I started looking through and thinking about, holistically, how are we approaching user awareness um, in our environment? Um, and so I kind of came up with a few things, which is number one, we didn't really have a clear, a clear goal on what we should be doing. So um, should we be trying to fail people? Should we be trying to inform people? Should we just be trying to collect numbers? Uh, you know, how should we be doing this? And then it became more of a, instead of a what, like a quantitative analysis, like the percentage is this and it went to this or whatever. It was like, why is this happening? Um, and I, I think one of the things I like the best about our, um, our training vendor is they give us a lot of data and access to a lot of data. Um, the other thing, and I'll talk about this a little more uh, later, I'm a data pack rat, and so I kind of keep data from other jobs when I've done this same sort of thing, or uh, I also uh, do a lot of side uh, penetration testing work. That's actually my background is as a penetration tester and, and um, social engineering type stuff. And, and so I keep it all. And I, I started to think, I was like, what if I take all this data and I put it together into like one unified repository and start to analyze it and start to get it to that why that I mentioned the second bullet point. So. And by the way, uh, I really don't think this presentation is going to last an hour. Ming generously gave me an hour to talk, or 50 minutes to talk. And uh, I don't even like to listen to myself for 50 minutes, much less subject somebody else to it. So if you guys have questions or comments, uh, feel free to just, just throw them out. That's fine. So, um, so anyway, redefining the goal of our, um, of our phishing testing and our user awareness training. And... I think we get into the mentality of we should try to be tricky, we should just constantly be trying to raise the bar, make it harder on our end users. But if it's just constantly trying to fail people, that's a very negative approach to it, you know? And I think you really have to have a more positive uh, approach where you have that positive feedback loop for the users where if it's really like you're teaching them instead of just constantly, you failed, you failed, you failed. Well, look, you know, I learned from the last one, but you made it harder this time, you know, it, it, and then I failed it again. It, it, you just, you will never get anywhere with improving those percentages and improving people's knowledge and, and they just get frustrated and they tune you out, right? I don't know if you guys have experience like that or not, but that's kind of been uh, my experience with it. But uh, yeah. I tell you what, can I address that at the end? Because I'm going to kind of talk about that. That's, that's, a, good, uh, that's a good point. Now, I would say sort of anecdotally, um, off the top of my head, the positive approach works better. Um, and I've got some more information on that that I'm going to talk about later. But, uh, but yeah, great question. Great question. So um, I talked a lot about stats. And uh, before I dig too much into this, and that's the best picture of a data scientist that Google Image Search has. Uh, so, but that is not me. Uh, I made lots of D's in math in college. D is for diploma. And so um, you will probably see statistical anomalies and things that I didn't analyze right or things where there are other reasons for, for the way they are uh, that tie back to the math. So please, uh, please don't take it out on me or be too hard on me. But um, anyway, 
Uh, I'm not a data scientist, but I do spend a lot of time at this place, uh, which, uh, and, and it's, it's jokingly I say that, but you know, it's literally looking at data to try to predict an outcome. I mean, that's, that's what it is. And uh, that's kind of where I learned to do my data analysis, was going to the racetrack and, um, and playing and trying to predict. So I had this idea, and I'll show you this. If you've never been to the racetrack, they give you a program and you get something like this on every horse in every race and it has every piece of information from the color of the horse from where the horse was born from you know how fast it ran the last race to a description of the last race to, i mean it, anything and and you can take as little or as much of that data as you want and you can throw money away uh betting on them which is fantastic uh but i started to think can we profile users like this can we take when there is some kind of incident that happens, or they fail a test, or you know, some, something else happens, right? Can you build a profile to start to predictively model that past performance and say, you know, these are the users who we're gonna have the, uh, the worst problems with, or, or gonna be the most likely to create a security incident, fail a test, uh, or we might need to train in a little bit different way. So that's all it is, it's really trying to predict an outcome. Um, and so I had kind of started reading these two books at the same time. Um, Picking Winners by Andy Byer. Andy uh, built the, uh, he's one of the best handicappers in America, and he, he built the uh, Byer Speed Figures, which are a way of taking data points and creating a metric for analyzing race data and, and how a race looked. And then Freakonomics. Who's read Freakonomics, by the way? Yeah, I read it after everybody else did. I think <laughs> I've been meaning to read it for years. It's one of those things you get, it's on your reading list, and you, know, you just keep putting it off. But um, you know, if you haven't read it, and I'll, I'll let somebody else speak to this better, they probably can uh, speak to it better than I, I can. Um, it's about taking things that seem like they wouldn't be related and, and, and using them to compare and, and predict outcomes and also analyze why certain things happen, like the hidden why of everything. So um, I, I really liked the ideas both of these books presented around trying to... Um, to analyze the data and um, uh, figure, figure this problem out. So I came up with two key questions. Um, and, and I wanted to decide, you know, what were the important data points to predict, predictively model, uh, who's going to fail a fishing test or who's going to fail a real life fishing test and do something bad in the environment. And I should clarify too, I'm not trying to predict just my own user training, I'm trying to predict everything, you know, fishing tests I didn't schedule that somebody else scheduled for me, right? You guys get those. And so, um, you know, can I predict who has a higher likelihood of falling victim? And are there things that I wouldn't think of that were related to a user's performance on phishing testing? And the, the first repository I started thinking about where I could get that data was human resources data. So that, that is where we had the largest collection of data on an individual. And I'm fortunate because I've, I've kept in touch with a lot of the HR uh, folks and uh, from places I've, I've done this work. And also we have some very generous HR ladies at my current employer who um, provided me with, and nothing real sense, and not like performance reviews or salaries or anything like that, but um, just data on people's resumes and, and job levels and years of experience and things. Uh, and it was really helpful data uh, as I started to dig in and take a look at this. So one of the things I would also say, this is a little different than a typical uh, stats talk in that we're not really dealing with something that's, that's static. Uh, this is, uh, <laughs> people are unpredictable, right? And no matter how many times you tell them to do something, they're liable to do this. Um, and um, human nature is very, very unpredictable. And also one thing I would say is, I'm gonna present what I found from my data and the data I had uh, your environment is probably very, very different. So the idea behind this talk is not to say everything I found is going to be applicable universally. It's to give you ideas about like, hey, I'm doing, I've got this awareness program, I've got this training program. How do I take the data I have and maybe look at it in a different way or a unique way and a way that we hadn't thought about before to make improvements in our own program? So, but yeah, I, I, again, no matter how much we analyze this, no matter what we come up with, somebody's always going to screw up, and, and I think we all know that in this room. Um, yeah, so uh, this is kind of where I started. I've got about 10 years of fishing test results uh, and uh, three different large environments. I've got side test work or uh, consulting work I've done. Uh, I've got data on security incidents, which were the, 
aforementioned unscheduled fishing tests where people failed <laughs> and uh, and kept those. Uh, took some HR data. I, I, I took a survey actually uh, of some of the folks who had failed our our tests. Um, of all the folks who failed our tests internally, and uh, I'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, it was just a simple little two question survey. Um, and some other miscellaneous data. I took it all and I threw it in an Elasticsearch, uh, which we'll talk about. And I came up with a sample size of about 3,200 events uh, that I started trying to make um, assertions from. And what I would say is also, you know, not everywhere did I have HR data. Not everywhere did I have certain pieces of data. Um, but I was able to query in subsets where I had different types of data, uh, which Elasticsearch is great for if you've ever used it. And I came up with about 60 working theories on what I thought would be an important correlation. And, you know, not all of them panned out to be anything or panned out to be statistically significant, but I uh, started about 60 and worked down to the ones that I found had the most statistical significance. Um, so, like I said, I used Elasticsearch, and number one on the list is it's free. Anybody in here ever used Elasticsearch? Okay, yeah. We like it, we don't like it. <laughs> It's great. I love Elasticsearch. It's so cool. Um, and, and for the price, uh, it's right. And like I said, I'd, using something that was schemaless, where I could have events where it, not every document had the same um, data points in it, was very, very helpful in analyzing the data since I had you know, uh, variances uh, in the data. And also, I was able to use Python real easily to, to dump data into it, uh, which worked really well. Um, so yeah, let's dive into the data now, and I'll, I'll kind of start showing you some of the things that I found. So uh, the first thing I did was I started looking at failures by years of experience. And my working hypothesis when I went into this was the people who have been around a long time, when, we'll, when I say that, that's a polite word for old, um, would fail more frequently. And I saw that there was actually some truth to that. And you see about a, in the top left of the graph there, the green slice. Uh, you yeah, about 26% of, of the failures I analyzed came from people with more than 10 years of experience. So no surprise there. And what really did surprise me, though, was the biggest slice came from the people with zero to two years of experience. So I was thinking, these will be the younger people. They're tech savvy. They've been around for security, or they've been around for security events and technology for a long time. They're going to be up on this stuff. They're not going to fail at a very high rate. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so I thought this was pretty interesting. And, and you can see also, you look at the, the sweet spot, about four to six years of experience. These are folks, they've been around long enough, and they're professional enough to be security conscious, but um, you know they don't fail at a very high rate. So those seem to be your lower risk users. But yeah, you have the people who are kind of on opposite ends of the spectrum in their career tend to fail more than anybody else. And so I, I was subdivided that 10 plus group further, and 40% of that group came from people with 22 plus years of experience, again, the old people. And uh, I hope nobody in here has that much experience, and I'm sitting calling you old right now. Uh, but um, uh, when I, when I look, started looking t in the, uh, the other slice uh, with the, the folks who had uh, less experience, um, I was able to correlate that back to our, the timing of the test where it went way up, I showed you at the beginning. So I gave that test in January when everybody had just graduated from college in December. So we had a lot of people with no experience who started then. And I was like, hmm, OK. And then I started looking at who failed, and it was a lot of the new hires. Uh, so the timing of your test, when you have mass numbers of new employees onboarding, can change the risk profile of your company to phishing attacks drastically. And I'll show you something else interesting about that here in a minute. So. I talked to our office managers. Uh, we have a pretty distributed environment, um, and uh, said, "Hey, would you work with the the folks who've been around a while? Will you help them take the training? Will you make sure they understood the high points of the training?" And, and the ladies were fantastic, and they they uh, they were very good about working with them, and got some really good feedback on that outreach to them as well. Because I think, and, and this is a tangent, but. Uh, some of the older folks who've been around with the rapidity of technology changing, they get intimidated by it. And to have somebody sit down with them and say, hey, look, here's what's important. We've given you this training, and we really want you to know this. I, I think it actually meant a lot to them. Uh, so I got some very good feedback on that. Um, and then the other thing I did is I actually changed our new hire training as well. 
uh, to add some new content and, and make them more aware and say, you know, you need to come in. I also changed the way uh, that we gave it. I used to give it to them to say, you know, knock it out in the first 30 days. Well, now they get it immediately when they're onboarded and they get a reminder every day to do it. So it makes sure they get it done since they are a higher risk group, apparently, from the data. So I mentioned the survey I gave. Uh, I give this just real quick little two question survey and I got a couple funny stories on this. Um, and I just asked them if, if they worked for a previous employer, did they uh, conduct security awareness training there? And then um, do, they, do people who failed these tests, uh, this survey was over uh, people who failed. Uh, and uh, if, do they feel our internal communications like HR, IT, so forth, are uh, easy to identify as legitimate communications? So as in, I can tell the difference between a phony one and, and a, real, or a uh, real one. And um, one of the things I found was almost nobody had had security awareness training in our environment or phishing testing prior to coming uh, to us starting to do it. So it was a new concept for them. Um, and, I, you know, clearly not enough companies were doing this. Uh, so uh, kind of my action I took out of that was since this is new, we want to continue to aggregate data. We'll continue to drive participation in our programs and, and get them used to it. And also, because they haven't had a lot of previous training, we may need to increase the frequency of our trainings, uh, and that one round may not be enough for a lot of folks. So, um, so that was pretty interesting. So kind of correlating to the question on the survey, and this is why I, uh, I wrote that question, on can you tell if our internal communications are legitimate or not, uh, I looked at the categories of failures. And I, this spread across all, all 3,200 uh, samples I had. And you see the top two failure categories are HR and IT. And the HR actually made a lot of sense because it ties back to the new hires. We talked about how they were failing a lot. Well, if you start a job and you get an email from payroll or benefits or whatever, yeah, I need to go ahead and do that. And you're highly likely to click on it. Um, so if you are a pen tester and you want to do your OSINT and uh, get on LinkedIn and see who just started a new job somewhere, that might be a good uh, vector. Yeah? Are those percentages uh, based on total failures or total outcomes? Total failures. Total failures. So out of the body of failures, this was the category that this they failed on. So. So 19.8% of the total number of failures uh, came from uh, emails in the HR category, templates in the HR category. So about one in five. Yeah. In general, subjects, subjects, the type of phishing, phishing emails you sent. Correct. Not yeah. No, 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 not departments. I apologize. Yes. Let me, th thank you. Yeah, that's a good clarification. This is not who failed. Yes. What's that? The phishing emails said, I'm in HR. I need you to go here and do this thing. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you for asking. That's a really good. That's a really good point. Yeah. So. Exactly. Yeah. The the uh, Office 365 ones. Those are fantastic. Yeah. That's a really really good question. So can I can I come back to that actually? I, just one second. Yeah, because I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. But. Um, sure. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah, you're talking about statistical skew there because of yeah. How often can you do each of these things? Well, and that's that's a good question. And so again, I was looking at a body of work that was across multiple environments and multiple uh, 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 engagements, I guess you'd say. So. This isn't just one environment where we did this every three months and we sent X number of, of uh, yeah. That's a good question. I'd have to go back. I honestly don't have those numbers because I draw from a random pool. And so there wasn't necessarily an even balance. Um, what I would tell you is there's an approximately the same number of templates for each category. So the odds of one being drawn over another is about the same. Okay. So does, it, does that help? Okay, yeah, good, good question, thank you. Anything else? You oh, God, okay. <laughs> you said you sampled in order to get that rather than looking at them all over your site. That one, this chart was actually built from all 3,200 because I had the data on all 3,200 failures. Yes, so, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm.
Yeah, and, and that's fair because you, I mean, you could have different populations of, of colleagues inside those companies who were, you know, some of them were younger and had less experience. Some had more. And I would say at our company, we skew toward the older a little bit. Um, but some of those environments, so one in particular was a fairly large uh, environment, about 3,000 employees that skewed more toward younger people. Uh, so if I had to come up with a distribution, again, you guys are challenging me on my data science skills here uh, and my statistics skills. I made a C in that class, so it was one up for math. Uh, C is for college. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I honestly didn't look at that data. That's, that's a really good way to dive into the data more and say, hey, you know, where, where is the skew and start trying to adjust the numbers uh, for that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's a I think it's a fair conclusion, and I, and I would say that probably because the sample size was so large, I mean I don't want to say 100 percent just because I don't have the data in front of me. I would say the the skew would be insignificant. Uh, I would say it's, it's going to be about the same out of every sort of category of, of age. So, good discussion. Was there anything else? Okay, one more. Right. Oh, okay, okay, we got two more here. That's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, yeah, actual security incidents. And is that reflected in yes, right yes, because I categorized. Uh, no, that would be a good thing to do. Yeah, I, I wanted to look just at the at a macro level at the entire body of data data when I was doing this, just to get an idea of what it looked like. Um, but that would be good for further research. Absolutely, some great ideas. Yeah, yes, ma'am. <laughs> We did. <laughs> they did not like it. They said it looked unprofessional when we replied to emails. So uh, they, what that again, and, and so that was that was on me. I, I'm okay. So we'll, we'll get off on a little tangent here. That was on me. That was one of the first things I did when I came in was say we need to do this, and we hadn't really built that trust in the security program yet to. Um, where they understood, like, if Russell's saying something, we probably need to do it. You know, it was more just me coming in with a you know, jackhammer, like, we need to do this, 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 this. And, and so one of the things I've learned, it's a cultural thing, is you have to slow down with them, and you have to bite things off in small chunks, and you have to, when you just start trying to grab and grab and grab, and like, oh, we need to do everything all at once, they don't respond well. So that was backed out. Now, we are revisiting that. Uh, and that may be something we wind up doing, but yeah, they, we derived that and they didn't like it. So, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, anything else? I think, yeah, one more and then I really do need to move on. We can ask more. We use those. Yes, we use the phishing button for reporting email. It's, we started with just a generic forwarding mailbox and then we use the button and they, they love the button. And one of the things that's great, the button we get from our training vendor, and you may know who it is, I think they all do something like this, is when it's a test and they hit the button, they get the little, hey, congratulations, you passed the test, and yeah, that works really well. So, no, thank you so much for the discussion. That's, that was a very good discussion. Um, so, uh, moving on. So, this is where I, I found a huge, huge disconnect. I mentioned that the survey data showed that, uh, or I gave the survey, and I asked them, I said, do you think that you can tell a legitimate email from our IT department or HR department from a phishing one? And they were all like, cool, yeah, we totally can. But then you go back to this and <laughs> you say, <laughs> so, so there's some huge disconnect here that we have, have yet to figure out. Now, now getting back to one of the questions, and I apologize, I forgot who asked it. Um, oh, it was about the trust in HR. We don't at, at our firm have a good standard look and feel for uh, internal corporate communications. They just kind of come from a person. And I guess we're kind of that, that small business mentality that we still have, because uh, we were small and then we got really big really fast, of everybody knows this is the HR lady. So when, when you know, someone else sends you something, then it's, it's legit. But um, yeah, so there was, there was no, there's no good consistent way that the communication is supposed to look and feel. Um, and so I actually talked to our, uh, our marketing manager about that and she is uh, working on a more standard template for communication. So if they look a certain way, they know it's real. And if they don't, it's fake. It's kind of a way of mitigating the, 
missing external tag of at least giving the email uh, the body should look away, and then if it doesn't, you kind of know it's fake. Um, uh, and and I, I've heard that she's had some challenges getting that done. They don't feel like it's really necessary, but uh, that, that's another one we're going to I'll fight to the grave on. So um, the next thing I looked at was timing. The next thing I found uh, statistical significance in was timing of things, uh, and I love this picture. Uh, but you know, how did timing related to certain events uh, affect people's performance uh, on on uh, phishing tests or uh, when it came to identifying uh, phishing messages in the wild? Um, and so this actually surprised me. So I started gauging uh, the number of people who failed based on the time it took them to complete security training. It could have been their annual training. It could have been a refresher training after failing, failing a phishing exercise. Um, it could have been um, just something else we gave uh, as an ad hoc. Uh, and generally, the training I always give 90 days to complete. Uh, and I thought that people who did it really, really fast would do really, really good on phishing tests. What I found out was they're doing it really, really fast just because they want to get it done and they don't care about what's in it based on this data. So you see, actually, people who completed the training within the first 30 days of a 90-day campaign accounted for, what is that, 43% of the, uh, of the failures. So, uh, yeah. In your, let's say, current employer, okay. you tend to complete a phishing training within the first 30 days. Like, is it most people or is it, like, not that many? It is... It breaks down pretty easy, evenly. So if I do a 90-day uh, campaign, it generally is about a third, a third, a third. Okay. Um, so uh, I do find that uh, I do start pushing on them. Of course, that may be the, the byproduct of the fact that I push on them every 30 days to get it done. They get a reminder. So, you know. Does the training have an evaluation after it? Uh, I give an informal one, yes. I give an informal training, yeah, or an informal evaluation, yeah. So I, I send out uh, spot checks to some folks. So um, anyway, yeah, I, this surprised me. So you see the, the block is the, the gray block is people who took a really long time to complete the training. They waited till the last minute before they got their network account turned off or whatever uh, to get it done. Um, that was expected. This block, uh, the blue block, I didn't expect. So People who kind of fell into the, they were waiting for the right time to do it and, and digest it uh, did fairly well. If you look down there at the, at the orange slice, uh, 30 to 60 days in, um, I think, think they did fairly well. So again, my conclusions I reached, completing training early, not necessarily an effective uh, <laughs> or um, an indicator of how effective the training was because people did still fail at a, a fairly high rate. Um, and people who, who wait for the right time to do it are, uh, are less risky than, than the other group. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I did change after this was the communication of the, uh, the um, training reminders. Uh, I actually did swap them to, to remind them in 30 days or, or whatever, uh, generally about a, uh, a third of the way uh, each time before the training deadline. Um, and the other thing I did was I, I talked to our office managers and I said, send me the, the busy times. So we're in, we do tax uh, and there's not just April 15th, there's various IRS deadlines throughout the year. And what I wanted to do was make sure people completed training outside the busy times because I knew if it hit busy time, they just wouldn't do it. So, um, so anyway. Uh, computer based training and. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's all right. So, so when I say training, it, that's a broad, that's a, a broad category. So we do an annual training, um, and we do refresher trainings, um, and then in other environments, I got some of the data uh, from, and also in our current environment, we do um, just kind of ad hoc. You know, a, a new firm merger or company comes on, we'll do a training then. Uh, we'll do. Sp specific targeted training as requested for various business units, that kind of thing. And so all that's gauged on this. So um, do, you, I mean, do we follow it up with testing? I mean, we just do the testing quarterly. That's how I've always done the testing. It's just quarterly. And it, from the time that they completed the training, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it can create a little skew. I agree with you. Yeah, but um, the, the training occurs quarterly. At, okay, let me say that. Generally, there is some kind of training for a population of users quarterly, and then there's there's phishing uh, quarterly. So, um, as well. So, um, this gets back to what you're just asking about too. So, I also looked at the days since a user took a training before they failed the test, and um, 
as you can see, about 60 days, 60 to 90 days out from the last time they took the training is where the largest body of failures occurred. So um, I thought this was pretty interesting. I, mean, I thought this actually told us pretty much the lifetime of our training is 60 days. And when I talk about training, I, I, one of the things I would mention is you only have to tell them to hover the mouse over the link so many times, you know, you would think. But I think any training you can give that's a little hint or just something about security awareness is it gets at top of their mind. And, um, and I think that's very, very important. Um, so. Is there yeah, that's about right. And so you do the training from the middle. When do you do the phishing test? Are they random or are they The phishing tests occur quarter quarterly. Um, I, what I said was some kind of training occurs quarterly. Our big training, we do outside tax time. The one that everybody has to take that's long, uh, we do during non-busy season, which runs about June 1st to September 1st. That was actually one of the things I improved from last year. When we did this last year, I did it and it overlapped IRS deadlines. And I got, um, I got a little heat for that, which my thought was you should have done it in the first when I sent it out because it wasn't busy time, you know, but then they waited the last minute and then it became busy time. And, you know, so that's how that worked. Um, so anyway, um, conclusions I kind of reached from that, that sample was that the training lasts about 60 days um, if we don't reinforce it frequently and refresh people. And again, it could just be refreshing people on any security topic. Um, well, they'll fail more. So uh, we do a lot of reinforcement now. We actually started sending weekly messages out, just little tips and things like that. Uh, I talked about doing multiple small trainings and getting away from like one large. You got to sit down and do it for a couple hours uh, every year. Uh, and I was told for us that's actually an issue because we use um, our training as internal uh, continuing education credits for uh, some of our tax and accounting folks. And so um, it has to be a minimum length. So I would rather do like four very small 20 minute trainings uh, than, than one large training. But um, I'm told that we, we can't do that. So, um, but something about for your environments if you don't have that challenge. Um, so other weird stuff, and I hope you're not weirded out by clowns. I thought a, a, a meme of Ronald McDonald talking on the phone about em environmental factors completely captured uh, weird stuff. Uh, but I looked at a couple other weird things, just kind of threw these in here for fun uh, here at the end of the presentation. Uh, uh, failures by time of day. Uh, you can see that early in the morning, lunchtime, going home time uh, tends to generate the most failures. Uh, one of the things I think happens here as well is when the phishing campaign starts, it generally starts at 8 a.m. I didn't think about this, and I've always done this with every one of them I've ever run. Starts about 8 a.m., and a bunch of people fail, and then they talk. IT's testing us again because they figure out that, and so it drops way down, and then, you know, the, there's a shift change, or people go to lunch, they're not paying attention, or they didn't get the water cooler gossip that I was coming after them, and then they fail a lot, and then it goes back down, and then at the end of the day, it comes back up. But, um, I think that's actually a good habit to get your users into because they, you know, they they communicate. Yeah. Any correlation on uh, day of week? Like Monday morning versus Friday? I did not find a statistically significant correlation uh, based on day of week. The only uh, it was all pretty even. Uh, time had the biggest uh, biggest impact. So that's that's a good question. Yeah, I, I did look at that though. Appreciate that. Um, and so, you know, it was uh, you know. I, I think, what is, oh yeah, users, I think, uh, getting them in the habit of talking, because, you know, one guy will say, hey, I got this email from, you know, the CFO, and, oh yeah, I got that email too, he's asking me the iTunes gift cards, and then they start to figure out something's not right, uh, which is really good, but, um, but anyway, um, I also looked at the weather, just because I thought it would be fun, <laughs> and so I wanted to figure out if it was raining or not raining, uh, and I did figure out that it, people did a little bit worse, not uh, statistically significantly worse, but a little bit worse when it rained versus when it was, uh, was sunny outside, so something to think about. Well, I <laughs> just thought it would be interesting to figure, to look at, you know, as one of those real Freakonomics things. I thought I could be in the next book, I guess. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so anyway. Um, few more thoughts uh, that I had that I want to share about stuff that, that we did. And we've talked about a little bit, bit of this, and I really do appreciate all the questions and, and discussion. Um, I've found, uh, and, and Christy and I have found, that the more we talk to people on a personal level, uh, it really, really um, makes an impact. And if you make them feel like they're contributing and they're making a difference in, in security, 
that they they do better. Uh, you know, I told you we have the phishing buttons, we have the spam box. We reply to every one of those messages personally and tell them. We they don't, they don't get like an automated form thing back. Like we reply to them all. Hey, thanks. Sometimes I'll even cut up and joke with them. Like, oh man, look at this guy. He sucks, or you know, something like that. Just, well, what an idiot. He misspelled your name in this email. You know, just something stupid to, to make them think it through and think that you're really paying attention. They are contributing. So um, I found that's really effective. Um, shaming never works. Never that you failed. You failed. Wall of shame for people who clicked on the most messages or whatever that that just doesn't uh, doesn't work i've also tried to run contests in the past and that um that creates some real animosity because apparently a 25 dollars itunes gift card is very coveted uh so you know whatever yeah We should. Now, now we use the button, and it has a, the positive feedback loop where they get the message that says, hey, congratulations, then you, you've passed the test. It's, it's great. Um, yeah. Oh, like if they... Yeah, I mean, we do in terms of, like I just mentioned, when they report things, we reply to them and say, hey, you did a great job catching this. That's awesome. I would love to have the budget to hand out like a tangible reward, like a Starbucks gift card or something, but our volume is way too high. The users, what's that? Use the ones I, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> that's a really good idea, yeah. Yes, we, we use security incidents uh, inside the sample as well. Yes. Um, yeah. On your experience, is there uh, a level where you get the sort of like phishing fatigue? Like, what's the, uh, what do you think is a good cadence for amount of phishing tests? Like, let's say, like, I think you said quarterly. Yeah, quarterly is what I prefer because they get worn out on them. And, and so that, that's, a, that's a good story. Um, so on the, uh, on the survey, I actually did leave a third open-ended question where I said, write me comments about the, you know, phishing tests or whatever, anything you want to, and, and it, you know, it'll be anonymous. You don't have to tell me who you are. And that became a field where people explained to me why they failed the phishing test or why they hate the phishing test. Uh, and so I had one who was just like, these are a distraction from our customer business. And, you know, I had... Um, I had, you know, I was buying my son a cell phone and got an email from about a cell phone and, you know, um, but they, the users do not like to feel tested. Um, and that was one of the things that our training vendor was very helpful in recommending me was like, give them the training first, make sure they're comfortable, make sure they're trained and then start testing them. Cause if they don't feel like they've been adequately prepared and then you give them a test, they'll hate it and they will never want to participate in it again. Uh, and so we made sure to do that. Um, so yeah, yeah. In the back, use your hand up for a little bit there. Yes, yes. We, yeah, we did, and we have a few who have been um, repeat offenders. And I, I tell you what, um, this gets back to the shaming thing. So this is a great time for that question. In previous lives, if we had repeat offenders, I went and talked to their manager, and said, "You need to get these guys in line," and. Um, that was not very effective because they got mad. They felt like they were under the gun. They were being, being uh, uh, strung up a little bit, hung out to dry, were tattled on. And um, in our environment here where I work now, I just reached out to him personally, getting back to that contact thing, and said, hey, look, I, we, we've had the training. You failed a couple. What can I help you with? And, and that approach I found works way better than going and, and trying to create some sort of shaming environment. Um, so, yeah. Um, what was the answer? Like, what did they say that you do that changed behavior? I mean, it, they, uh, you know, I got a number of different responses. Uh, some, some of them gave me the excuse, this is why I failed. And some of them were just like, really, uh, there were complaints about the IT department. You know, I don't understand what's legitimate and what's not, and which we saw from, the, from some of the, the data. Um, uh, but mostly they were just embarrassed. And they said, I'm so sorry, I failed a couple of these, you know, how can I do better? And they reached out and said, and I gave them the sort of the flyer of, of hover the mouse over the link, look. And, and, and the folks, I tell you, the folks we reached out to personally, they've never failed another one. So, um, oh gosh. I, t I tell you what, could you guys hold your questions for the end? I'm going to run through these last couple slides and then, then we'll field some more. So, um, 
I just got two slides left here. Uh, so um, of, the, of the results, uh, I don't feel like I've got enough data. We haven't implemented everything yet. Again, I've had some challenges with some, getting some things implemented. But um, we did drop 2% uh, after the bad test where it went up to the next test. So I felt like that was really good. Now, I want to do a couple more tests to make sure that wasn't some sort of just anomalous thing. I want to see, particularly with the timing we talked about, the next batch of new grads who come in. I want to make sure they do better and, and just make sure that, that uh, it's a continued trend downward before I say conclusively, this is the panacea for everything in our environment. Um, but I will tell you the feedback I've gotten, and, and really more than stats, when people email me and say, I really like the training, I really like the stuff you guys are doing, it makes me feel better than seeing a percentage drop down or something like that. So um, I've gotten a lot of that, uh, and, and that's, um, that's, that's been very, very helpful. Uh, so uh, anyway, yeah, uh, that's, that's it. That's the material I've got. Uh, thanks again, you know, Ming, for uh, introducing me and, and uh, Packet, Hacking Village guy, Packet Hacking Village guys for letting me come talk. Uh, that's me. I'll throw these slides up later there uh, if you want them. And uh, yeah, let's grab some of the questions uh, and have some more discussion here. So. All right. No, no, let me answer your questions. Come on. All right. Yeah. Did you separate the results for actual training or direct exercise? No, I, that, that, would be a, that would be a good next place to go. So the question was, did I separate the actual phishing emails from the, uh, the tests? And yeah, I, I want to just look at the whole body of data. Because I like to think my tests are so good, they're like real phishing emails, I guess. So anyway, um, yeah. Uh, no, no, I'll go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll get him next. Yeah. So. 15 minute refresher training. Yes. Uh, <laughs> my licensing for my training platform doesn't let me get to the games because I'm on a budget. <laughs> so, uh, but that's something I, I would like to do is actually analyze that and printed material versus an interactive exercise. I like our training vendor. Uh, I'm not here to sponsor anybody. So I'm not going to say who it is, but they, the training they provide is highly interactive. So I, I'd like to think that's, uh, that's some of it um, as well. Let me see. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And then I'll grab you back here. Okay. Right. I well, I and I think that gets back to that whole data where you're talking about technological aptitude, where the younger folks who I would expect to be more technologically apt than our older folks still failed regularly. So that that lines up exactly with what you uh, you just asked. So yeah, that's a great point. Um, yeah. Look. That's a good question. Yeah, so um, I will tell you that uh, was. Are you asking for two parts? Like, did I compare failures to successes, or just strictly around holidays? Okay. Uh, no, I look strictly at failures in this this exercise, and that that's a, a great question. And that would be another another um, really the successes. I only have success data on my current environment. I don't have it on previous environment, so that, that would be a little bit more difficult. Holidays, that would be a good timing-based thing to look at as well, so um, that's a good question. I just kind of looked at day of week and, and time and things like that, so um, yeah. No, never. Uh, <laughs> no, some people like to take their junk folder and just fish, 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 yeah, so they, they do that, yeah, so yeah, we get a lot of them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they, there should be a distro. That's actually a good point. But most of them just email me directly. So we have a fairly small security team. It's the two of us. So between one or the other, it's, they find one of us. So yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I, you guys fight it out amongst yourselves. Who wants to talk first? I <laughs> Mm-hmm. We do that, too. Yeah. The good thing about uh, the vendor we use uh, is it's a, it includes the original URL as a query string parameter. So I actually teach people like, hey, look, it, it, it's not right here where you'd expect and where the training says it is, it's over here. So yes, correct. Yeah, so it's still in there. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Good question. Um, so I'm a 
Sure. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. That's that's. Yeah, I mean, we're, our environment's about twenty two hundred. Uh, so we get a hundred ish a day, maybe. I mean, it just depends. Yeah. Now, one thing we do, I I, I will say this. So if we get a broad, um, like four hundred people get the same email and they all report it. We have a, a little WordPress site I nailed up, and we'll just post it there, and people are actually referred to that. So, like, hey, before you send something in, check the fish board, see if it's on the site first. Um, so, uh, you know, really what we're applying to is a lot of the one-offs. Um, it's, um, we really need about five interns to do that so we can do better stuff. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. While they're trying to hover, <laughs> yeah. So there's a study saying that they were kind of backtracking the whole hovering. Well, and we try to train them in multiple parts. That's like, that's like one of the last things we tell them to look at. It's really like, who's the sender? Were you expecting it? Does it have an attachment? You know, all those things. And then the hovering is sort of a last resort. Now, we're also fortunate, too. We use the vendor that does the link rewriting. So they've blown up the link and scanned it, and it lands them on a splash page that says, this may be malicious. I've also found the splash page doesn't stop our users from clicking on things. So, I mean, you know, we've, we've layered up God knows how many URL filtering and that, and they, they still somehow go around all of it. But, uh, yeah, anyway. So, I think that, anything else? Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yes, it can. And it actually lost a ransomware attack. Ooh. By, by ransomware. So, yeah, it only affects about nine users, but still, you got to make sure in your environment, if you say hover over, that you have the right GPOs, you have the right technology behind Podium. you, that you could actually be introducing another. That's valid. Issue. No, that's, that, that's a great point. That's, that, that's actually something to think about. Okay. Anything else? Oh. That's awesome. Yeah. Do you have experience? You mean in terms of multiple like email domains and no, or just the yes? So ours right now we're spread way out. Like I mean we're uh, I work from home and I'm not near any of our offices. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we have about 80 offices and they're spread from across the lower third U.S. Do you see any difference between like say home office does great, but like Yeah, actually, that that's a really great point. And so we did have, and this is not my current company, this is a previous employer, it had a similar decentralized environment. Um, we did have an office that was out in Seattle who we never visited just because they were out in Seattle. And I, I'm from Nashville. And so we found that they did not do real well on the phishing tests repeatedly. They didn't have a local IT. They didn't, we didn't do any security testing. They were kind of man on an island out there. And um, yeah, that, that is the amount of interaction you do with them, uh, it does make an impact. Yeah, so I, I think it's really important to try to make everybody feel part of a, a program and, and feel that personal touch, so. Yes, yeah, we actually took a trip out there and we sat down and had a, like a security brown bag, two hours, just me and um, our director of compliance and let them ask whatever questions they wanted and things like that, so, yeah, so. Is your data based on domestic or is it international data? Uh, this is all domestic data. Only domestic data. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Do you do any statistics on the device that was used? We do track statistics on the device that was used. And uh, I have found that mobile devices, people will open crap on their iPhones every time they get it. So, um, yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys. I, I know this is a tough time slot. Oh, I'm sorry. There are a couple more questions. For using templates? Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, well, so now I stick strictly to what our training uh, vendor provides. But um, yeah, in the past, you can clone. I've cloned a few. So yeah, good. Well, thank you again for coming. Appreciate it, guys. Yeah.